Brothers and sisters, last week we talked about this powerful dua, the supplication that the Prophet ﷺ taught us to have to remove our anxiety, to remove our fear, to remove our grief. And we talked about how simple it is. And we talked about some of the distinctions where the Prophet ﷺ taught that young man to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala min al-hammi wal-hazan from al-ham which refers to anxiety about the future al-hazan refers to grief about the past wal-ajzi wal-kasal from laziness I I'm sorry from inability and laziness al-ajz means when you don't have the strength you actually are fully incapable of doing anything for yourself wal-kasal which is when you have the ability but you don't have the will laziness the inability to do, though you have the means. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned al-jubni wal-bukhul from cowardice and from stinginess. Those two things where you hold back either your courage or you hold back your wealth out of fear of what you will be letting go. Should you spend from yourself in courage or should you spend from your wealth in generosity? And then min ghalabat al-dayni wa qahr al-rijal from the burden of debt and from being subjugated to man. Now I'm going to venture to say that the last part of this hadith is actually the most misunderstood part of this hadith even though it's the most easily identifiable part of the hadith. People know what it feels like. Anyone who has been in debt knows the misery of debt. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow everyone that is suffering from the burden of debt to be relieved of it. Allahumma ameen. We know what it's like to be at the mercy of another person and how humiliating that can feel to have your stakes rest upon whether or not someone else is going to show you some mercy. To be at the mercy especially of someone that you don't particularly like maybe, or an enemy, or someone that just makes you feel little. No one likes to be in that situation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us always independent of His makhluq, of His creation. Allahumma ameen. However, when the Prophet ﷺ was seeking refuge in Allah from these things, <clears throat> He was not seeking refuge in Allah from these things because of the worldly consequences of these things, which is very powerful. If you look at the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is really seeking refuge in Allah from su'al akhlaq, from bad characteristics, from bad traits. He's not looking at the worldly consequences of these things as much as how those worldly circumstances lead to akhirah consequences, consequences of the hereafter. Meaning, if I am lazy, I'm, I'm not doing what I need to do to better my situation in the hereafter. If I am stingy, then I'm not spending in a way that will elevate me in the hereafter. If I am cowardly, then I am not showing the courage that I will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. That these are things that have akhirah oriented consequences, hereafter oriented consequences. Now, what about debt? The Prophet ﷺ was a man who could easily never have a debt. There's probably no one in the society of Medina that did not need to worry about debt like the Prophet ﷺ, not even Abdurrahman ibn Awf anhu or Uthman ibn Affan anhu. Why? Because if the Prophet ﷺ had a debt, all he had to do was this, and then everybody would pay off his debts. Who would not respond to the Prophet Sallallahu saying, I have a debt. Yet in his humility Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he died in debt, but not ghalabat al dayn So I'm gonna make this distinction first. There's a difference between owing someone $3,000 or $300 and owing them $100,000 or $200,000. There's a difference between a debt that is crushing you for years and years and years and years and a debt that, you know, it's, it's, it's smaller, it's more manageable. And the Prophet Sallallahu debt was manageable debt. And that's from his wisdom Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that though he lived a life of poverty, he did not Alayhi Salatu Wasallam take on debts that were not manageable. So till the last day of his life, he used to, for example, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do business with some of the people of the book in Medina. He actually owed 
uh, he, he pawned his shield وسلم, to a Jewish neighbor at the day of his death. He was managing those types of relationships with society and teaching the ummah how to transact. But ghalabat al-dayn refers to a debt that is insurmountable, that's just really over your head. But he could have even done away with that too, right? So guess who was surprised at why he seeks refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from debt so much? Aisha radiallahu anha. She said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, I'm amazed at how much you do isti'adha, you seek refuge in Allah from a dain, from debt. Like it's, it's, on one hand, you can easily do away with it. On the other hand, the Prophet ﷺ does not take on unmanageable debt. Ya Rasulullah, I'm surprised how often this comes up in your dua. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Innahu man gharima, that when a person is in debt, haddatha fakadab. When they speak, they'll learn how to lie. Wa wa'ada fa'akhlaf. And when they make promises, they'll start breaking their promises. What a powerful hadith. He's our teacher sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's saying that the greatest consequence of debt and being in a compromising situation, in a vulnerable situation, is not the humiliation when you get that phone call or when you have to meet your debtor and the debtor starts to become rougher with you. It's that you might take on the akhlaq of nifaq, the characteristics of hypocrisy to get yourself out of that situation and you might get good at it. You might actually get good at it. So yes, brother, uh, inshallah ta'ala, you know, oh, uh, I was waiting on one thing and then you make up stories about why you're late on paying the person back. You make up stories to delay. You start lying and getting good at lying. You start making promises and breaking those promises more frequently and so you take on half of the characteristics of a munafiq, of a hypocrite while trying to get yourself out of a worldly situation. Do you see how profound that is from the Prophet wasallam? That he's saying, Ya Aisha, I'm not doing this because I want people to, I don't like the, the, the feeling of having my ego bruised a bit in this world or some of what comes with that. It's because when people become accustomed to compromised and vulnerable situations, then eventually they start to compromise of their deen and they start to compromise of their akhlaq, of their religion and of their characteristics to get out of those situations. And that's why the Prophet in another profound hadith عن علي رضي الله تعالى عنه that the Prophet وسلم, told a man shall I not teach you some words that if you say them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of your debt your deen particularly your debt even if it is like a mountain قال عليه الصلاة والسلام اللهم أكفني بحلالك عن حرامك وأغدني بفضلك عمن سواك again اللهم أكفني بحلالك عن حرامك وَأَغْنِنِي بِفَضْلِكَ عَمَّنْ سِوَاكَ Oh Allah, suffice me with your halal, with your lawful, so that I don't resort to the unlawful. أَكْفِنِي بِحَلَالِكَ عَنْ حَرَامِكَ Let me have enough halal so I don't fall into haram. That's my reason. Not because, Ya Allah, give me more halal income so I can have a bigger house, so I can have a nicer car. It's okay to ask Allah for those things. But my main concern is that I don't want to be in a situation where I have to dip into haram. And your fadl wa bi fadlika, and this is a hard one to translate, and bestow upon me your favor, your bounty, so that I don't need anyone but you. Allahu Akbar. Amman Siwak, I want to keep needing you, I just don't want to need anyone else. Why am I bringing this to the discussion for us? When you see those ahadith where the Prophet ﷺ teaches us to seek independence, you know, he made the Sahaba take bay'ah to him, allegiance to him. Allah as'alu nasa shay'a that I will never ask anyone for anything, even if one of our whips or something in our hand fell when we were on top of our horses and camels, we would get down and get it ourselves so that we don't ask someone else to get it for us. It's a mindset. It's a mindset that Al-Mu'min Al-Qawi, 
that the strong believer is better than the weak believer. It's a mindset that you seek a position of strength. To be the giving hand, the upper hand is better than being the lower hand. It's a mindset for a community. Rabbana la taj'anna fitna lilladina kafaru. Oh Allah, don't make us a fitna, a tribulation for those who disbelieve. They see us in weakness. They think that they're beating us. And because they think that they have power over us, then they feel even more invincible and immune to having to believe in Allah because look, we're crushing the believers. We seek positions of strength as individuals and as communities first and foremost so that we don't resort to that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah knows that sometimes when we're vulnerable and we're compromised, that's when we will compromise our faith and that's when we might do things that are very dangerous. And there is no greater example. It's one of the least flattering stories of a Sahabi that you will find that I'm about to share with you. But it's shared in our tradition for a reason. And it's actually shared by the man who is guilty. Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a ta'ala anhu. Hatib was one of Ahl Badr, the veterans of Badr, the cream of the crop of Islam. The best that you can think of of the companions. And when the Prophet ﷺ was about to go to Mecca, for the conquest of Mecca, Hatib looked around and he didn't have tribesmen in Mecca. He didn't have family in Mecca, meaning if things go wrong, there's no one from the kuffar, the disbelievers in Mecca to say, okay, we'll protect him. We know this was a bad fallout, but at the end of the day, these people put tribe over creed. We'll protect our tribesmen and we'll take care of them. Hatib had no one in Mecca. And in his moment of feeling vulnerable, like I'm going back to Mecca, I don't have anyone. He did something horrible, horrible. What did he do? He, the Prophet ﷺ confided in a group of companions about his plans to go to Mecca. Hatib took those plans, wrote them in a letter, called one of the disbelieving women, and gave that letter of the plans of the Prophet ﷺ to go to Mecca to deliver to the heads of Quraysh. That's treason of the highest order, right? I mean, that's really compromising the mission compromising the Prophet ﷺ, putting the Prophet ﷺ in a very bad situation. And this is a person of Badr, a veteran of Badr. And so the woman takes the letter, she puts it in her hair, she wraps up her hair over it, she puts her khibar on top, and she makes her way. Jibreel ﷺ comes to the Prophet ﷺ and tells him what Hatib did. So the, the news from the heavens comes that there is a letter in the hair of this woman and she's in Rawdat Khakh, a very particular garden right now. Ya Rasulullah, send someone to go stop her and get that letter back. The Prophet ﷺ calls Ali, Miqdad, and Az Zubair radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he says, go to this particular place. There's this woman, she looks like this and that. And she has a letter in her hair with the news of what I plan to do in Mecca. Make sure that you get it from her. So they go quickly to that garden, they find the woman. They tell the woman, give us the letter. She says, I don't have a letter. Ali radiallahu anhu says, look, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. We really don't want to do this the hard way. Give us the letter. She takes it out from her hair. She's not even Muslim. Takes it out from her hair. She gives them the letter. It comes back to the Prophet Wasallam. If you are Hatib right now, I mean, you could deservedly be, deservedly be killed. You almost put the entire community at risk because of your own compromise, your own vulnerability, your sense of insecurity. Shaytan played with, that, with his head in that, ma in that manner. So the Prophet ﷺ calls Hatib. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu is standing next to the Prophet ﷺ. <clears throat> Ali, Miqdad, and Zubair are there. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Ya yeah, Hatib, what did you do? Hatib says, Ya Rasulullah. I thought about all of you and you have people in Mecca to take care of you. If things go wrong, this person has his tribesmen. And I wanted to have a hand with Quraysh in case things did not work out so that I would be protected too. And Ya Rasulullah, I knew that Allah would give you victory in the, anyway and that they were not going to be able to overcome you. I mean, it's, it sounds contradictory, right? But he's saying to the Prophet ﷺ, but Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, I did not do that out of any allegiance to kufr, out of any wanting disbelief, or out of any getting out of Islam. It was a moment of weakness, I regret it, I hate that I did it. But Ya Rasulullah, don't think I did that because I'm, I'm Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Saloon and I want to undermine Islam, I want to hurt Islam. I got weak, Shaytan got me in my weak moments. The Prophet ﷺ, 
Here's his excuse. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu says, Ya Rasulullah, let me take care of him. That's Umar radiallahu anhu's answer. And he's right, right? I mean, in the sense that justifiably so, this is treason. The Prophet looks at Hatib and he says, he's telling the truth. And he said, Ya Umar, it might be that Allah looked to the people of Badr and said, I'malu ma shi'tum faqad ghafar Allahu lakum. Do as you will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you. And so Allah has forgiven you, O oh, Hatib, seek Allah's forgiveness and go back. SubhanAllah. The Prophet ﷺ could have killed him and he would have been justified. He didn't do that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What was Hatib radiallahu anhu thinking? He got weak. And sometimes when we get vulnerable, that's when shaitan finds his easiest way into our heads. That's when he finds us in our low points. In our low points. When the money is tight, haram money becomes so tempting. When we feel like we've been wronged, it becomes so easy to wrong someone else. Right? Isn't that how a lot of injustice perpetuates in society? Someone wronged me, so I'm going to wrong somebody else. That's how cycles of abuse take place in families, entire families. My parents abused me, I'm going to abuse my children too. Because shaitan preys on those moments of insecurity and vulnerability. However, let me just put one thing aside with Hatib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. No one of us ever went to Badr. So Hatib committed a grave crime, but he had a grave, a great deed on his scale that's unlike anyone else. So we don't count on getting the forgiveness that Hatib radiallahu ta'ala anhu got, but we learned the lesson of Hatib. And we learned the lessons from these ahadith. That first and foremost, when we make dua to Allah, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, put us in a position of strength. It's not because we enjoy arrogance. If that's your intention when you're making the dua, because I don't want to be talked down to, I don't want to feel less. That's not the right intention for these duas, dear brothers and sisters. When you supplicate to get yourself out of these situations. And by the way, if a person ends up in a situation of weakness regardless, that we're not a people who believe that those who are wealthy Allah loves and those who are poor Allah hates. No. You're being tested with your position of strength, others are being tested with their position of weakness, but you seek a position of strength so that you don't find yourself in a position of compromising your faith. Recognize the tricks of shaitan when he comes to you and tells you, you're weak, you're in debt, you've been wronged, it's your turn, it's okay, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And for those of you who have never been in that situation, May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us all out of that situation. Make that the intention for the dua of min ghalabat al-dayni wa qahr al-rijal. That Allah protect us from being in a position of being overburdened by debt or subjugated to man. Not because it's going to hurt my ego, but because it might hurt my akhirah. I might develop bad qualities and characteristics and traits I don't want to develop. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from ever resorting to haram as a means of curing our harm. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our character, protect us in this life, elevate us in the next life. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasna fi al-akhirati hasna wa qina adab al-nar. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah wa lakum risa' al-muslimin fa astaghfiru innahu al-ghafur rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. If you enjoyed this video, please do share it with friends and family. If you want to see more videos from this series, click on the box at the top. If you want to see other videos, click on the box at the bottom. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thanks.